And the, the challenge in this situation is the, the alternative plan raises risk. We've got increased risk on the, on the baseline plan. And, uh, and we always knew that a test flight uh, potentially was a bit higher risk than uh, return from with a vehicle that has a lot of flights under its belt. It's been 70 days today, Wednesday, August 14th, that Butch and Sonny, veteran astronauts, have been, well, some might say stranded at the space station. Last week, we learned that NASA would probably have to make a decision in mid-August whether or not Butch and Sonny would return via Starliner or if they're going to come home in February of 2025 via a crew dragon. Well, today I learned that mid-August actually could be defined as the 26th of August. During a media briefing today, which we knew that no decision was going to be made, NASA announced that they expect to decide on returning Boeing Starliner crewed or empty by August 23rd through the 26th. So again, we run into that word data. Ken Bowersox, who is the NASA Associate Administrator, talked about how they need to have the return data analysis completed, which they're expecting to have done by the middle to the end of next week. Eric Berger posted that based on his intel, he thinks it's becoming more and more likely that the astronauts will come home via Crew Dragon. So make your bets in the comments. Do you think that they will return home on Starliner, that NASA and Boeing are trying to do as much as they can to make that a reality? Or do you think that they're just buying time and the decision has potentially been made behind the scenes and they're going to come home with SpaceX in many months? Regardless, the decision keeps getting pushed out, which is kind of frustrating. One of the questions that people have had is about the physical and, you know, health side effects of Butch and Sonny staying there for much longer than they had intended. Potentially, they'll be up there for eight months. Well, NASA's chief astronaut, Joe Acaba, says a potential eight-month increment on the station is well within the safety range for long-duration stays. NASA also announced today that an uncrewed Progress spacecraft carrying nearly three tons of food, fuel, and supplies is set to launch the space station tonight. So, yeah, they're going to need that extra food because there's extra mouths to feed out there. By the way, the Progress is an expendable unmanned cargo spacecraft developed to regularly resupply the International Space Station. It's derived from the Soyuz spaceship design, just in case you were curious. Ken Bowersox was quoted today saying it's a fairly major discussion to decide whether or not we're going to have crew on board for Starliner's return. I mean, the fact that he's admitting this and it's taken so long and it continues to be pushed, I just feel like if they were meant to come home on Starliner, the decision would have already been made. If there's this much internal discussion and doubt, it, it just don't, don't risk it. One of the questions that was different this time is, how does Crew 9 feel about all of this, considering that if the leading contingency plan, which would be to send Butch and Sonny home with the Crew 9 in, you know, 2025, Two of those astronauts that had originally planned to go on the mission will have to stay grounded. How do they feel about that? Here's what NASA had to say. Yeah, this is Joe, and we. Um, I just talked to Crew 9 yesterday, so they are definitely informed of what is going on with CFT and any potential impacts that it could have on their flight. You know, we've uh, moved their launch date from the August timeframe into September. And, you know, I think I'm, I've said it a few times, but, you know, it's kind of part of our jobs. And we realize that launch dates may slip, launch or uh, mission durations may change real time. Um, so again, as professionals, they're doing great. Um, we are all concerned for our crew that is on orbit and they are willing to do uh, whatever it takes to support those crew members. So I guess it'd be nice to hear from Crew 9 directly, but I doubt that that's going to happen. But but basically, it sounds like they understand that this can happen, things can slip, things can change. So hopefully they have a, a good spirit about it. But I know that if I had been training for that and, you know, it was just ripped away from me, it, it would be pretty soul-crushing. 
Another question that I thought was interesting, what are the risks for Butch and Sonny if they don't come home on Starliner? We know that they are weighing the risks of potentially returning home on Starliner, but what if they do come home via Crew Dragon? So uh, we can let other folks weigh in on this. The the type of risks that I see if we uh, go with the uncrewed return for Starliner is, as you mentioned, there's additional radiation for Butch and Sonny. There's uh, additional time on orbit. Uh, there is um, the uh, contingency question. Uh, if, uh, if we use the Dragon as the contingency vehicle for, for Butch and Sonny, um, Joel mentioned that they would have to execute a contingency without suits. There are some of our contingency situations that, that require suits, right? So we don't have full protection in those situations. Uh, so so th- th- those are the types of things that, that raise the, the, the risk level um, and, and, and complicate our decision process. So again, we're hearing in this example that there is also risk, according to NASA, associated with returning home in Crew Dragon. And similar to last week, today Boeing was not on the call. Now, CBS asked a question, if Starliner comes back uncrewed, would it be classified as a mishap? And apparently, since it would be a NASA intervention and not a real-time failure to remove the crew, it may not meet their definition of a mishap, triggering a next-level review process. Now, a lot of people have asked in the comments, how do Butch and Sonny feel about all of this? You know, we haven't heard from them in a while, and... Do they feel comfortable with all of this? Butch's family was actually just interviewed in the news about, you know, him potentially staying up there for eight months. So according to NASA, they are getting briefed and updated, but they are deferring to the ground for decisions and they're prepared to do what they are asked to do, which is really the type of spirit that you want in a test pilot. We are getting uh, new data and and it's interesting how as time goes on, we've got new folks that uh, as they become aware of what's going on, they're, they, they're offering um, inputs and expertise, uh, and, and it's been very valuable. And so now it appears that they are seeking advice from new experts. I mean, is this rocket science? They must have a lot of political pressure on them in making this decision. One of the questions was about Challenger and Columbia and some of the lessons learned from those tragedies and how they impact this decision moving forward. And I'm just wondering if both of you could think back to the time of Columbia, and I'm sure there are folks there still from the time of Challenger, and talk about how this process has evolved from what happened with those tragedies. How do you see all of this playing out differently than it might have played out in the past? Two things that I'll, I'll, I, I feel like I'll point to, and, and one of them is, is kind of how I started. You know, we did, not have, we did not have the governance structure that we have today with the technical authorities. So at that time, the program managers pretty much had um, near unilateral decision making. And so if there were, if there were uh, views that uh, maybe a, a, a path we were taking was not correct, there was really no strong um, additional authority to step in and say, wait a minute. And then I think the other thing is, um, you know, I, I, and I'll say for me personally, I've, I've been very hyper-focused lately on, on this concept of combating organizational silence. If you look at the both, unfortunately, Challenger and Columbia, you know there you could see cases where people had uh, the right data or or, or a valid uh, uh, position to put forward, but the environment just didn't allow it. And and I think we've worked a lot harder these days in, in sensitizing everyone to making sure that we have the right environment for people with different positions can can bring them forward. I, I recognize that that may mean at times we don't move very fast because we're getting everything out. And I think you can kind of see that on, you know, at play here um, where I think some people were like, hey, let's, let's get on with it. But it really is part of part of that that lesson that we learned is, is you need to have equivalent technical authorities outside of, of the program and we need to be very careful 
to make sure that everybody's everybody's uh, perspective is is shared. Yeah, and and I was going to uh, say that back uh, around Columbia, we had uh, an input from safety, we had inputs from engineering, we had dissenting opinion process, but it it wasn't really called that. I mean, back then we had this thing called the NASA safety reporting system, and if you saw something that wasn't good, you were supposed to bring it up, and and something could get elevated right away. But but what our current process does is it it raises the volume on those um, those inputs from the tech authorities, from the from the safety folks, the engineering folks, from from uh, flight crew, the centers, and and it gives us a a formal way uh, to encourage and to um, uh, analyze and 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 make a decision on on dissenting opinions. So. Um, there's still one point where it all comes together, right, and that's up at the top. Um, this uh, gives that person at the top a chance to get the best information uh, when the decision's made. So this is just a short update from today. I knew heading into this that they weren't going to be making a decision, but you can bet that I will be following this. Um, you know, who knows? It actually could be on the same day as the Polaris Dawn launch if they actually do announce by August 26th. Hard to believe that they will also be launching at that time with Jared Isaacman and crew still haven't decided if I'm going to try to do a last minute trip to Florida, but this is your Boeing Starliner saga update today. And here's a perfect outro. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started from a cape launch pad aboard a brand new ship. Butch was a mighty engineer, sunny, brave, and true. Two astronauts set sail that day for a 10-day review. A 10-day review. The launch had faced a few delays and various problems found. But finally the ship took off with Butch and Sunny bound. The ship arrived at ISS and it didn't take long to know. They're stranded there for much longer than they had planned to go. The crew aboard the ISS gave them a place to stay. Did spacewalks to repairs and more. They bravely worked each day. So join us here each week my friends it'll probably be a while for two brave souls lost in space here on iss isle